Hello and welcome to Kids Rule TV brought to you by English Heritage. I'm Esme and I'll be your guide on this time-travelling adventure through English history. We'll be joined along the way by some fascinating historians and Hello. a few other helpers. Hello. So if you've ever wondered who built Stonehenge or how the Romans changed British history forever, then you've come to the right place. Coming up in today's show, we're travelling back over 1,600 years to a place called Angleland, otherwise known as England, home to the Anglo-Saxon people. Joining us is historian Dr. Michael Carter, who will talk us through the key players in Saxon religion. We'll meet St. Augustine, a medieval monk who was sent to England on an important mission from Rome, and St. Hild, an Anglo-Saxon princess and spiritual leader. We'll also show you how to draw a Saxon and Viking warrior and whip up some tasty cakes for you to try at home. So let's dig into this week's show. First, we need to go back no further than that, way back to AD 410. With the Roman Empire collapsing, the Roman army was ordered to leave Britain. Mm -hmm. Grouped of people from Northern Europe called the Angles, Saxons and Jutes started invading England. Together, they became known as the Anglo-Saxons. They left their homes in what we now know as Germany, Denmark and Scandinavia in search of money and treasure. They sailed in wooden boats over to England where they settled mostly in the southeast and northeast in places like Northumbria. Over time they started building villages and farming on the fertile land and they changed the population living in Britain at the time forever. So who were these people and what happened when they settled in England? I think we need some expert help. And I know just the person. Hi, Michael. Hi, it's me. Wonderful to have you on the show. Thanks so much for the warmth of that welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Esme. So, Michael, I wonder if you can tell us a bit about the Saxons and what they believed in. Who were they and what religion did they follow when they came to England? Well, they're peoples from Northern Europe and Scandinavia, and they came to England in the hope of a new life. Um, it's because at this time, there were loads of movements of people across Europe, and it wasn't always very peaceful. We know that they brought pagan beliefs with them. They would have worshipped multiple gods, and they were based on the forces of nature. So you may have heard of Wodin or Odin, who was the king of their gods. And interestingly, it's where we get the day of the week Wednesday from. Now, the Saxons would have heard about Christianity, would have been well aware of it before arriving in England and actually when they got here. And they would have been quite interested about this new religion and its messages. And also it was the religion of the Roman emperor. So that meant power and wealth. So who were the most important people in Anglo-Saxon religion at the time? Well, we have to talk about St Augustine. He started out as a monk in Rome, but little did he know at that time that he was eventually destined to become a very important man in English history indeed, with the title of first Archbishop of Canterbury. Woo! Now, everything changed for Augustine in the year 595. This was when a man called Pope Gregory the Great, the head of the Catholic Church, the Bishop of Rome, sent in on an important mission to England. Now, at this time, England was divided into multiple kingdoms, which were often well, fighting each other. Each had its own king, and Pope Gregory wanted Augustine to visit the Anglo-Saxons and persuade them to abandon their pagan beliefs and embrace the Christian way of life. Augustine's mission began in Kent. This was a home of the most powerful Anglo-Saxon king at this time, that's King Ethelbert. Now, if Augustine could persuade him to become a Christian, that's something we call conversion. Aww. It was thought he would be able to persuade the other Anglo-Saxon kings to do the same. So what was their first meeting like? Luckily, we have a written source for it. 
A famous monk in the 8th century called Bede wrote about Augustine's arrival in Kent. He describes in getting here with 13 missionaries. They're men who came with him to preach the Christian message. But Ethelbert was scared about these foreign missionaries and that they might use magic against him. So he insists that they meet outdoor. And he also gathers lots of followers with himself as well. B describes the meeting of the two men as being actually very peaceful. The monks hold up a cross as an emblem of their religion. Christ crucified is on it. And Ethelbert allowed them to preach to him and his companions there and across his kingdom. So did Ethelbert decide to become a Christian? Well, probably not at first. Although it must be said he was kind to Augustine and he gave him permission to live in his kingdom of Kent and to preach the word of God to his subjects. Now, King Ethelbert does eventually become a Christian. And by the year 598, he's allowed Augustine to build what becomes a very important monastery, an abbey dedicated to St. Peter and St. Paul. Wow, so interesting. And you can see a reconstruction on screen now showing what the abbey would have looked like at the time. So what happened next? It sounds like St. Augustine's mission was a success. In the years that followed, his efforts to convert to Anglo-Saxons to Christianity spread across the seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, but some Anglo-Saxon kings resisted at first. Augustine died in about 604, but he had some helpers who continued to carry out his important work. Ah, who else was influential in bringing Christianity to England? Another important missionary was a monk called Hadrian. Now, he's really interesting because he was born in North Africa. And he then first travelled to Italy, where he became a very respected monk. In 667, the Pope offered him a very important job to become the next Archbishop of Canterbury. But Hadrian refused the offer and asked that his friend, a monk called Theodore, should be appointed to that office instead. That's a kind thing to do for your friend. <laughs> well, they both travelled to England and became very influential indeed in spreading the Christian message to the Anglo-Saxons. And by the late 600s, Christianity was the main religion across most of what's now England. The Abbey itself became one of the most influential monasteries in, in the world at that time. And it remained so for more than a thousand years. Later in the Middle Ages, it was named in honour of St Augustine, St Augustine's Abbey, and you can still visit it to this day. Wow, how amazing is that? And if you'd like to visit St Augustine's Abbey, you can find the link here or visit the English Heritage website for more info. OK, so that's just the beginning of the story. I'm going to talk a bit more about the other key figures a bit later, including an Anglo-Saxon princess. Thank you, Michael. Bye for now and speak to you a bit later. Catch you later. So what was life like for those people that did become Christians? Let's travel to St Paul's Monastery, Jarrow, in Northumbria. It's AD 730 and apprentice monk Benedict is just starting his day. It's 7am and Benedict has already been up for three hours praying. His daily life is a mixture of work, learning and, most of all, prayer. <sighs> Benedict is new here and still getting used to the routine. He's very hungry by the time he gets to eat breakfast. There are more prayers before the community of monks assemble to discuss work for the day and tell off any monks for bad behaviour. The 
the monks spend the next few hours working in the kitchens or outside the monastery in the fields. Benedict helps pick cabbages in the garden. There are more prayers before lunch. The monks provide all their own food and make their own beer. Benedict's beer is very weak as he's still young. In the afternoon, the monks either write new books or copy out old ones. Holy books are written in Latin, which Benedict and the other novices are learning. In just a short time, St Paul's has become famous across Europe for the writing by the monks there, including a monk called Bede. Bede is nearing the end of a book called The Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which is the first English history book. There are more prayers and services with all the monks learning a new type of singing called chanting. It's still light outside when the monks go to bed at 7pm. The novice monks sleep in a dormitory. Yeah. I don't know about you, but after watching poor Benedict working so hard, I'm feeling a bit hungry. Let's have a look for an Anglo-Saxon recipe. Ah, this one sounds good. Honey, oat and spice cakes. Delicious. If you want to try this recipe at home, you'll need 250 grams of porridge oats, 125 grams of unsalted butter, 50 grams of chopped dried apricots or dried apples, four large tablespoons of runny honey and one level teaspoon of ground cinnamon. And here's one I made earlier. Ta-da! The Anglo-Saxons didn't have sugar, so they would have used dried fruit or honey to sweeten their food. If you want to try this recipe at home, here's the full recipe or read our show notes for the link. Let's have a taste. Mm. Now, did you know that many Anglo-Saxon Christian leaders became saints? We've already learned a bit about Saint Augustine, but there were also important women yeah. in the story of Anglo-Saxon religion, like Saint Hild. So who was she? I think we need our expert again. Michael, are you there? Great to be back. So who was Saint Hild? St Hild was an Anglo-Saxon princess and she puts all that behind her and becomes a nun. Mm. She was born in 614 and becomes abbess. That's the head of a very important monastery for men and women at Whitby Abbey on what, in what's now North Yorkshire. <laughs> With Hild in charge, the monastery became one of the most important places in the Anglo-Saxon world. <laughs> and she could even work miracles. How cool is that? Wow. Well, to find out more, let's watch her story. On 
Whitby's wild and windswept cliffs, before the conqueror came. There lived a dame of royal blood, and Hilda was her name. Her zeal inspired the local folk to join her in her labours. To build a house to honour God. Despite some noisy neighbours. Snakes wriggling and slithering, their hissing filled the air. Wherever people tried to step, they'd find a serpent there. But Hild was not frightened by the snake's intimidation. She prayed. And her prayers led to an incredible transformation. The writhing reptiles turned to stone. Each one decapitated. And cast into the tumbling sea, quite incapacitated. The folk of Whitby were amazed, and all of them waxed lyrical, that Hild, before their eyes, performed a bona fide miracle. For ridding Whitby of the snakes, and being an abbey builder, our heroine was canonised, and so became Saint Hilda. You can still visit Whitby Abbey today. Here's the link to find out more. You never know, you might even find some headless snakes on your travels. So we've heard about how Hild became a saint, but who else was big news in Anglo-Saxon religion at the time? We need to talk about St Cuthbert. <laughs> He was a great monastic leader, but also a miracle worker, and also had great healing powers. Mm. He's in charge of Lindisfarne in Northumbria, and he becomes a bishop uh -oh. in about 685. At the time, monasteries and churches have been built all over England, in places like Wessex, Mercia, East Anglia and Northumbria. Some were in very remote places indeed, uh, like Lindisfarne, which is built on a kind of an island, a headland called Holy Island in Northumbria. And you can only get there twice a day at low tide. Yeah, we can see Linda's farm appearing on the screen now. It does look beautiful. So what was life like there for St Cuthbert and the monks? Well, the monks had quite a hard life. They spent their days praying, working and studying religious books. And they also spent some time creating books as well, including the very famous Lindisfarne Gospels. It's beautifully illustrated with some very clever designs. And it contains four smaller books that give the life of Jesus. And it still survives to this day in the British Library. Now, Cuthbert also shared his island home with flocks of ducks at Lindisfarne. These became known by the locals as cuddy ducks, after St Cuthbert. It sounds like they led a very peaceful life there. But I have a feeling that things didn't end well. 
Oh dear, unfortunately not. In the year 793, the Vikings arrived on the scene. Gulp. Locals in northeast England reported seeing fiery dragons flying through the air. They were terrified and took this as a bad sign that things were about to get very nasty indeed. Oh dear. So who were the Vikings? How were they related to the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes that came before? The Vikings were Norse people and came from modern day Denmark, Norway and Sweden. The Saxons, the Dangles and the Jutes were more Germanic, but they were definitely interrelated and there were lots of similarities. Why did they first come to England? They were after treasure. Linda's farm would have been an attractive and easy target. It was a place of great wealth and because monks lived there, it was poorly defended. But the Vikings didn't stay long. It was a very bloody snatch and grab raid. And to be honest, it was pretty horrific. <laughs> they destroyed the monastery and they took lots of treasures with them, including gold crosses and probably some of the books as well. Oh, what happened to the monks? Well, they fled and wandered around northern England for many years as it was too dangerous to return to the monastery. And they eventually go over to Ireland. Well, it's been so interesting chatting to you, Michael. Thanks for joining us on the show. Bye, Esme. Now it's time to get your pens and pencils out as we're going to get crafty. This week, we're joined by our Kids Rule illustrator, Wesley, who's going to be showing you how to draw Saxon and Viking warriors. Ready? Then let's get creative. Over to you, Wesley. So if we start with a Viking's helmet, start with a round semicircle, and if we join those two ends up with a sort of flapping bird shape, And then in the middle, we can draw two lines and put three little rivets in, in between those. Next, we draw a line coming down in a curve to a point, and then join that up again at the end. We can draw two leaf-shaped holes for him to see out of. Next, two little dots for eyes and two little angry eyebrows. Next, we can draw a little round nose poking out below. If we come to the left and draw a little semicircle and a squiggle, and the same again on the right for his ears, then go back to the left and down and in for the bottom of his beard and join that up. Next, if we draw the top of his moustache, so round and up behind the nose and then down again. We can join those two corners up with a little rough scratchy line. And then we can add a big angry mouth in the middle. Maybe add a few wisps of hair as well. And then we can draw the knot of his beard. So, a little squiggle. And then a big tuft of hair where it's all tied up. And if we come to the left of the ear, we're going to draw the plait behind. So, some more squiggles. And back round and in and then again another tuft at the end. And then if we come down to the beard, to the right of it we want to draw a big round shield. So round, and then the same again on the bottom, and join those up. And 
and then he would have had a little metal boss in the middle. So a round circle in there, maybe a few rivets in the middle as well. And then we can divide this shield up, make a bit of a pattern into four. So four curved lines to divide it up equally. Maybe add a few dinks, scratches and dents in. Make it look like it's been used in battle. Next, if we draw his shoulder on the right, so just behind those two. And then for the left one, come out, all the way round, down, and then back in to his armpit. If we take that line down, up to the top of the belt, so across behind the shield, and then do the same again. And a little bit of the belt where it's just folded behind, tucked in. Next, if we draw the arm, so come out to the left, down, back up for the cuff, and then join those up, again like that. Maybe add a few folds, a few creases, and a bit of stitching, a bit of DL on his cuff. We can draw his thumb, and then one, two, three, four knuckles. And the hilt of a sword, so another one there. And a little round bit behind. And then a line coming out to a point. And then the same again on the top. We're drawing in with a sword because axes came a bit later. And then if we go in the middle and do a sort of dotted line, break it up in places, just makes it look a bit shiny. And then for the bottom of his mail coat, you can come out behind the arm, and a big wavy line across. And then down below the shield, behind the sword and join those up. And we can add a few little squiggles, a few little semicircles, just to give the impression of that mail armor all those rings of metal. And then under that, the bottom of his clothing, it's another wavy line, just following that. And again, a bit more stitching, a bit more trim on the bottom. We can draw the tops of his legs. So round and back up, and down, round, and up again. And then for the bottom of his legs, two little oblongs. Join those up. And some lines filling those where the fabric's wrapped around his legs. And finally, two pointy little shoes at the bottom. And then for the Saxon helmet, I want a big up, round, and down shape. And this is based on the Coppergate helmet. And then for the middle, we want a sort of M shape. So in, up down, back up, and down again. Then we could go up, and around and up to the top, and down, and that will give a bit of trim to the helmet. And then we can add the cheek guards. Down and back up. Next we can give him some angry eyes, so big circle, a little pupil, a little dot in the middle. And the same again for the right hand one. And then two thick eyebrows. 
and then we can give him a little moustache just below his nose guard. A few wisps of hair. And again, another little angry mouth. We can join those up with his jaw. Next, if we do two squiggles to the right and down to the top of his cloak, we want to draw another round shield here. So up and round and the same again on the bottom and join those up. Put another little boss in the middle. A few more rivets. And then for a bit of variation, we're going to keep this as a leather covered shield. So just a few scratches, a few dents in this one. And if we draw the other top of his uh, cloak, it's another squiggle. Out and up and have that sort of folding down, just sort of below the middle of his head. And then we can have a line intersecting that and down behind the shield, where the ends of his cloaks are folded over. And then draw a little round circle with a bit of detail, and that'll be a brooch holding that together. We can add a few folds of the fabric in. Just a few swooshes. Next, if we come out and draw his arm, so a line coming out at an angle, down for the cuff, and follow that along behind the cloak. And we can add a bit of stitching as well, a bit of trim on his cuff there. We draw one thumb, and the four knuckles, and then his four fingers. And then we can draw a little round bit below for the hilt of his sword, another bit above, and another line at an angle going up to a point and coming back down again for the other side of the sword. And then the same game what we did with the Viking, a little broken line just to make it look a bit shinier. Next if we come up to his armpit, sort of down and round, and then across for the top of his belt. Do the same again for the bottom of the belt. And again a little bit tucked below. We come out to the left then a wavy line across and join that up below the shield to complete his mail coat. And again, a few more squiggles, a few more semicircles, just to give that idea of the, the rings of mail. We'll draw the bottom of his clothing poking out below. So again, another wavy line across and a little bit of stitching, a little bit of trim. And this time we can give him some trousers, so some big oblongs. Another rectangle for the right hand one, a bit of a wonky rectangle. And two pointy shoes below those. Then we can come up to the left, so the back of his cloak, so following that all the way down. And then a wavy line across behind one leg, behind the other, and then join that up behind the shield. We can add a few folds. in the fabric there. 
and that's the Viking and Saxon. So for the colouring in, we're going to speed this bit up, but you can take your time at home. Thanks, Wesley. That was fantastic. How did you guys get on at home? Here's my creation. What do you think? <laughs> I'm quite pleased with it. The team here at Kids Rule would love to see your creation. So if you've had a go at Anglo-Saxon baking or drawn some characters from history, do share them with us at kids at english-heritage.org.uk. And that brings us to the end of our show. It's been a blast and I hope that, like me, you've learned a lot. Don't forget to subscribe and for more activities and fascinating history facts, make sure to visit the Kids Rule website. Join us next time for more travels through English history. Bye for now.